Hey guys, the Nedrukberg here. Hope you're doing well. This is going to be a continuation off of the last video where we discussed and configured basic OSPF, where we set up a backbone network. Now, in this video, we're going to be focusing on some more OSPF concepts. We're also going to specifically be looking at different areas, area types, network types, and link state advertisements, or better known as LSA. So definitely going to be a meaty bit of a video again but since there's so much to cover i will be putting everything in a timestamp format again so in the description you can go to any point in the video using a timestamp to just drill down on a specific subject that you maybe want to be better familiar with or a subject that you want to revisit um, before i also start the video i just want to give a shout out to kenneth natuda he asked for a shout out in the last video and i saw it in the comments so i told him i'd do it so hello kenneth and i'd like to thank all you guys that also just uh, help support the channel still but also everybody that's always engaging with me and giving me ideas for new, new videos and content and such so anyways let's get into the video and have a good time with ospf Cool. So <laughs> this is going to be the same type of format presentation that I also did in the last video. But like I said, in this video, we'll specifically be looking at different network types, areas and LSAs, and also specifically area types or stub types, as we like to refer to them. So let's just go through this presentation quickly. And what I'd like you to notice is the OSPF network types. So by default on Marketic, there is four different types of networks that you can configure on an interface. And they basically work in pairs. Your broadcast and NBMA or non-broadcast multiple access networks, they will typically elect a DR and BDR, which is in essence, think of it again as a central point where all of the link state advertisements are sent to and the link state updates are being done. And it is responsible for sending the updates to the rest of the network to keep the map basically updated and relevant so that all of the devices don't have to scramble around to figure something out. And then we also have point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint network types. Now, these are, in essence, devices that will either connect just to a single point or perhaps a bunch of smaller routers, let's call them customer presence equipment, CPEs. They might connect to a single point like a provider edge router, and that might be considered point-to-multipoint. Similarly, maybe you've got a bunch of, if you're a WISP, you have a bunch of towers, all of your towers connect to maybe some central point. That again might be a cause for point to multi-point configurations. Now, what's the difference between it? Again, it's the DR or non-DR, but if you go for point to multi-point or uh, point to point, then there is no DR and BDR process. All link state updates are done between the routers directly in real time. Whenever there's a change, all of the routers will be aware of it. And also, um, there's nothing that's going to be responsible for updating the LSDB, since every router is in essence then going to be responsible for it. So both type of networks has their pros and cons, but you might typically see broadcast and point-to-point -point a lot um, just by default, because it's easier to configure and what you're going to be doing or using it for. The NBMA, or non-broadcast multiple access, um, it works on unicast so it, it doesn't discover any new neighbors automatically so if you want to use this type of network then you need to specify your nbma neighbors in a separate tab on the ospf but it's pretty straightforward you literally just go to a tab say what the ip address is of the remote device and there you go now you can start doing the nbma you just need to make sure that your network types match across the interfaces if one type is point to point and the remote side is using broadcast your ospf is not going to connect all right now let's talk about the ospf areas which is awesome because ospf areas allows you to break up your autonomous system into smaller parts now this helps a lot with um, let's say cpu overloading <laughs> even though it's not so much of an issue these days because we've got pretty big machines and routers with big cpus um, but it's definitely a very useful thing to be able to do because you can break up your network in certain parts because maybe you're onboarding a new network and you don't just want to learn all the routes or you don't want to risk stuff then you can put them in their own little area learn the routes that way see what route you're learning from that area and just it's it's kind of like i don't want to say it's like vlans but it's 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 sort of a similar thing um all that you need to understand with the areas though is 
areas also allows the Dijkstra algorithm to run within that specific area. So cost calculations are done inside an area. So whatever costs is in area zero, doesn't really have anything to do with the costs inside of area one. So the calculations are done on an area level. And in the same vein, your LSDB, the link state database, will be updated inside a specific area. So area zero will not update the stuff in area one. And area one will not be updating the LSDB for area two as an example. So just something to be aware of when it comes to OSPF areas, but it does just help with scalability. That's actually the keyword. It, it, it scales your networks a bit better. All right, now, Let's talk about the OSPF stub types or the area types as we refer to them on Microtech. And there's three types you're mainly going to be working with, namely the default type. So whenever you set up a new area, it will have the default type flag in it. And all that means is LSAs will be flooded normally between all of the devices. It might be broadcast. You might see stuff like um, LSAs one, two, three, and four and five. And we'll get to what those LSAs mean in a second when we get to the next slide, but it's just in essence, the default state that an OSPF area will be working in. Then you get stuff like stub areas. Now a stub area in essence will work inside an area where you might only have like private networks or devices that's not going to be connecting to some type of external network. It's very useful to have an area where all of your private networks may reside because then you don't need to like learn all of these different LSAs. It can also just make everything a little bit smoother when it comes to learning routes or updating the route table. Um, so stub area in essence, what it actually does is instead of receiving LSAs type four and five, the router will just send out type three LSAs. So it will announce to your whole private network, hey, if you wanna to get to any of these external networks, just use me as a gateway. That's that's kind of what it gets down to. So it will kind of just advertise different announcements or network summaries or such to get outside of its own area boundary. And then lastly, we've got something we call an NSSA or a not so stubby area. Now these areas, they kind of consist of stubbiness. So they're kind of still, you've, you may have private networks and such on them, but let's say you have a connection to a different network that's using a routing protocol like BGP or RIP or something, or, or maybe it's just another internet link. And this internet link, it's not coming in directly into your area zero or into your backbone, but you still want to be able to learn the routes and broadcast it or advertise it across the OSPF network. Now, NSSA or a not so stubby area is great for this because you can still get those external routes, but an issue with stub areas, since they change all of the LSA types to type three, you can't do type four and five, which is in essence used for external routes, then a stubby area or not so stubby area can then advertise out an LSA as LSA seven to your area border router. And then that area border router can receive that LSA and then basically translate it to the appropriate LSAs, which would be four and five to the rest of the network so that they can know how to get to those external networks. All right, so now we can talk about the LSAs. So primarily there's going to be six common LSAs you'll see. The first three, you'll definitely see a lot. And then the, the type four, five, and seven, you might only see once you start working with very specific stuff like ASBRs, or you work with not so stubby areas and such. But definitely it is good to know all of these LSAs. I will put a link in a pinned comment to some uh, reference material that you can go and have a look at. I looked at the material myself and I found it very helpful and it will help you understand all of the areas. It will also contain all of the other types you may see because you do get up to type 11, but in essence from type one to five and seven, those are the common areas or the common LSA types that you will see when you're working with OSPF. Now I just want to talk about some of the LSAs quickly because think of these as pieces of a puzzle that OSPF uses to map out the entire network. So whenever you enable OSPF on your interfaces and it starts running OSPF, it will generate an LSA type one or a router LSA, which is going to contain stuff like the networks associated to your interfaces, as well as interface costs and all that type of good stuff. Then you get stuff like your type two network LSAs, and these are on your transit network within an area. So 
the main word here is where a DR is elected. So this is not going to work or you won't see any type 2 LSAs on point to point links. You will only see type 2 LSAs in a single broadcast domain. So let's say you've got like three or five routers. They're in the same slash 29 network. These routers will then use a type 2 LSA to just confirm stuff on the network between each other the whole time. And then lastly, the big one that you'll see a lot, especially when you work with areas or multi areas, is a type 3, a summary LSA. Now, this is the LSA that will be used to advertise routes between different areas. So whenever you've got a routing table or you're advertising routes between areas, it's not going to send the costs between areas. So that's the OSPF cost, but it's still going to have to give a listing of all of the routes to your, let's say your neighbor, your boundary area. And that list will be inside of your summary LSA. So the summary LSA will tell you exactly how to get to specific subnets or networks. And then your area or ABR router can within that area then make costing decisions and stuff to the rest of the network. And then we've got stuff like the type four and five LSAs and they work in conjunction with each other actually. Big one is the type four LSA will tell the network so it will tell the members in that OSPF area how to get to a specific autonomous system boundary router, how to get to the internet or an external route. So it's basically just informing the members in that OSPF area, hey, if you want to get out to these networks, you're going to have to go to this gateway, which is your ASBR. And then the type five is actually the ASBR telling you what the networks are. <laughs> so it will say, hey, I'm the ASBR. And if you want to get to any of these, let's say public subnets, you're going to use me because they are in another autonomous system. So the type five is just actually saying, hey, these routes exist in another AS, but to get there, you can use me to get to them. And then lastly, we've got a type seven LSA. Now these are very interesting because you'll rarely see them unless you work with not so stubby areas. And this is when you have a not so stubby area configured and you do have an external autonomous system connecting to that stubby or not so stubby area. And you want to advertise those public routes or those networks, those external routes that you're learning from that area or from that uh, autonomous system. So not so stubby area is still a stub area in essence, but you still need to be able to advertise the routes to the network. But since it is considered a stub, it cannot use type four and five LSAs because stub networks don't operate with type four or five LSAs. They only operate with type three. And there's no way to advertise those external routes as type three networks because they're not internal. The OSPF is smart enough to see these are external routes. So what does it do? It does a little bit of a change route, a switch, a swap. It just says, hey, I'm gonna use a different LSA then I'm gonna use a type seven and I'm gonna tell you how to get to these external networks in this uh, other uh, autonomous system. And it will send that type seven LSA to an area border router. And then the area border router will basically just translate um, that type seven LSA to the appropriate type four and five to the rest of the OSPF network. All right, so this should cover our basic um, discussion. So let's jump into the lab and actually configure these things so you can see in real time what happens when you set up these different types of areas and area types. And we'll specifically be looking at LSAs as well. So let's get into that now on EVE. All right, so here we're in the EVE topology. It is the updated topology. And this, I feel, will just help us better understand what's happening with OSPF and the LSAs and all that good, good stuff. Now, I've drawn these arrows, which will basically be showing you in which direction an LSA will typically be traversing or being flooded. Um, if you see it's dual sided, it's basically like a broadcast type of LSA. Whereas if it's just going a single direction, it's kind of like how traffic is being pushed for that LSA by some type of uh, router or mechanism. Now, area zero already exists in this topology. It's already up and running. And the ASBR on the edge that's connecting to the internet can already distribute a default route out to our ABR or area border router. And this area border router's main function is going to be to connect to different areas. It is worth noting that with OSPF, each area needs some form of a link 
back to area zero. If you use a multi-tenant or multi-area type of um, OSPF setup, all your areas needs to get back to area zero. There might be cases that it's not able to have a direct link to area zero, in which cases you will use something called a virtual link or a logical link, but we will make a separate video on virtual links and touch on that on its own topic. Right now, I just wanna show you how to configure areas, what LSAs look like, and just how cool OSPF really is in distributing routes and redistributing routes and just working. And it's really such an awesome pro like uh, routing protocol. All right. So first thing I wanna do is actually log on to the ABR or the area boundary router. So I'll get onto Unbox and then I'll log on to the ABR. And now adding an area is really straightforward. We're just going to go into our routing, OSPF, and then I'm going to navigate to my areas. And now I can create a new area. I'll click on the plus, I'll make it area one. And now we can set the instance. Only the default instance currently exists, but if you were using a multi-instance type of environment, perhaps you have different instances for different routing tables, this is where you can select that instance. And now I can set our area ID, which is going to be 0, 0, 0 0.1. I can also set the type now. And my topology, I've listed this as the default type, which means it will be able to receive type 2, type 1, type 4, type 5, type 3 LSAs. Um, but we're also going to set up a bit of a uniqueness with um, this area 1 link, because we're going to set up uh, the connection between the ABR and the R1 default router as a point-to-point -point link, which means LSA type 2s will not be flooded across because it, it, there's not going to be a network for it to uh, pick up or do anything with. All right, so let's just leave it as is, apply this. And now I just need to specify my network. Now the network is going to be the address between my ether 1 and 2. So I'm going to make this 10100-30. And remember, whatever networks you specify in here, OSPF will basically be advertising out. So I'm going to add 10100-30. And make sure you select the correct area. So this is going to exist in area 1. I'll apply this. And if I go to my interfaces, it would have configured a dynamic interface. But since I just said I want this to be a point-to-point -point network type, I'm just going to make this a static interface and then change the network type to point-to-point. -point. I'll apply this and then I will do the same thing on router1-default because we now need to set up the OSPF on that device, on that router. So I'll quickly log on to another Winbox session, connect to the ROM on, and then I'll connect onto R1-default. Now that I'm on there, let's just zoom in. And some prerequisites again. We're going to set a unique router ID. Now I've made 192.0.0.1 and .2 the ASBR and ABR. So from there, I'm just going to start upwards. So I'll make .3 the next router. So that will be 192.0.0.3 for my R1-default. I'll apply this. And then I need to add my area. So this is going to be area one, instance default, area ID 000 0.1, type default. I'll apply this and I will also add my network. And similarly, I will add 10.100/30 for area one. And I will also just make this a static interface and change it to point to point because if your network types don't match, it will not connect. Similarly, if the areas do not match, it also will not connect. Now, if I look at my interfaces, we can see the state is point to point. And if I look at my neighbors, I can actually see I do have a neighborship with router ID 192.0.0.2, which is the router ID of the ABR. I can see on which interface, how many state changes there have been. And I want to just go through these tabs again, because from here we can see our LSAs, the link state announcements that we're receiving, the pieces of the puzzle to help us keep the LSDB updated and be aware of how to get to which destinations. And you can even have a look at the routes tab to see exactly which routes you're learning. You can see which instance they belong to, which area they were from, what the destination address is, what the gateways are, 
interfaces it will be going over, what the total cost is. So that is again Dijkstra and it's all its glory. It's working out the best cost. And based off of that cost, it will then choose that route and inject it into your routing table and the state you'll see. Now the state is also pretty interesting because it refers to which areas routes may exist in. You'll see stuff like inter area, which means it's inside of your own area. You'll get stuff like like <laughs> inter area, which is just a short change. Sorry, I spazzed out there for a second, but I couldn't see it for some reason. Inter area is related to routes that you've learned outside of your own area. So it's still OSPF. It knows it's OSPF, but it's learned it in a different area. So in this example, it would have learned a route in area zero. And then you get stuff like your external route. So EXT1 or EXT2. So those are types of external routes. And the differences between external one and external two is external one will typically just be preferred. Its cost is taken more into consideration when you want to route across the network. If you've got two routes for the same destination with the same costs and everything, but one is a type one and the other one is type two, type one is always going to be chosen and get injected into the routing table. So think of type two almost as a secondary type of route that you can add. All right, now let's continue. Um, I just want to verify a few things with the LSA. Since this is a point to point network now, we should not be receiving any type of network uh, LSA, but we will receive router LSAs, which is correct because like I mentioned in the presentation, the router LSA is related to your interfaces on your router as well as the remote side. What is their interface cost? Is it up? Is it down? All that good stuff. Then we've got a summary ASPR, which is in essence a type 4 LSA that's been sent out to let us know how to get to our ASBR. And then we've got the type 5 LSA, which is the AS external type, which is just telling us how to get out to the network, how to get to an external network or to the internet. And then we've got a bunch of summary networks, which is the LSA 3s. And again, LSA 3 exists between areas. It's an LSA that's going to be flooded between two different areas that will give a listing of whatever routes that exist in an area to another one so that they can also know how to get to that area. But important note, it doesn't really uh, facilitate the cost. Your cost is still worked out inside your own area. You're just going to have a listing of how to get to these new destinations that OSPF has learned about via a different area. All right, so let's continue. We've got this set up. You've seen some of the LSAs and what we've configured or can see at the moment on the default area. Now let's configure a stub area as well. Now this is going to be a lot more fun because now we've also got a bunch of LAN prefixes or subnets that exist on this router. And we're also going to advertise those networks out and even do a little bit of route summarization. So let's get that done by logging onto the ABR. So I'm also just going to close the R1 default now. So on the ABR, let's add a new area. And this is going to be area two. My instance is still going to be default. But here again, the area ID is going to be different. It's going to be 000.2. And now I can specify my type as something else. So I can specify this as a stub area. Now here you've got the option to inject summary LSAs or not. Typically you will inject your summary LSAs because it's just a summary LSA, you know, the type three LSAs. If you don't inject them, um, then you're probably not going to receive those LSAs and it might be problematic for some routing. But there are times that you might not want to send out the LSAs. But let's just in inject the LSAs in this instance. I will hit apply. And now I need to specify my network in that area. So if I look at the topology, my network is 10200/29. It's the link between the ABR and the R2 stub. So I'll quickly add the network. And there's one important thing I haven't done yet, so I actually need to do that now. Actually, I think I was slash 29. Put that in area two. Um, oh, we haven't gotten to that point yet. I need to still do the CP configuration. Never mind. All right, so now I've got a dynamic interface for broadcast that will work there. I'll just copy this and apply it. I do prefer having the static interfaces, reason being with the static interface, we can now change stuff like the authentication methods, or we can even add some stuff, change hello timer values, 
Um, and very important, we can set the network types and the costs. Very important. All right. Now we've got the area two interface configured. Let's add the configurations on the CPE now. So I'm going to log on to Winbox on the R2 stub router. And now on R2 stub router, let me just maximize here. We're going to go into our routing and OSPF. First thing I want to do is update my instance, which is what I was thinking about just now. So this is going to be 192.0.0.4. Again, it needs to be unique across the network. I'll apply this. Now let's add our area. Area is going to be area two. Instance default. Apologies, I didn't zoom in. Our area ID is 0.0.0.2 and our type is stub. And here I might not inject some LSAs because I'm not going to send any LSAs out to the a remote side but anyway let, let me leave it on let's just leave everything the default values here this is just for demonstration purposes now now let's add our network which is 10 to 0 slash 29 10 to 0 0 slash 29 make sure you specify the area correctly and if i look at my interfaces i've got a dynamically created interface so let's just copy that and apply it so that it's a static interface and if I look at my neighbors, I can see I do have a neighborship. If I look at my LSAs, I can see I am receiving LSAs. And I should, in theory, only be receiving these three types of LSAs. Summary LSAs, which is type 3. Router LSAs, which is type 1. And a network LSA, which is type 2, since I did connect on a broadcast type of network here. All right, so this looks good to me. Let me see, do I have a default route out? I can get out to the internet in theory, because I've got a default route out from my ABR, which it received from the ASBR. But it's cool because I'm not seeing the 000 route as an external route. I'm just learning about it as an internal route from my ABR. Here you can see there the route exists, but I don't see it as external, which is the reason why we're using the stub so that the routes are all considered internally. All right, this is perfect to me. Now let's do the cool bit of stuff. Let's actually distribute out these LAN networks to the area zero and even area one and three, they, they'll learn about the networks as well. So first thing I want to do is I just want to add those networks in my networks tab. And I might just do this from the command line quickly because this might be a bit faster. So routing OSPF network add my network will be 192.168.0.0 slash 24. And this will be in area two. Before I hit enter, I just want to verify on my ABR that I'm not receiving any routes like that. So I can see I'm not receiving any 192.168.0.0 slash 24 networks or any 192.168 network. So let's add, I'm going to add 192.168.0.0 slash 24. And if I go to my ABR now, I should actually receive that route via OSPF. And if I look at my OSPF tabs and I look at the routes here I can see what route I've received and I can see I've received that from area 2 192.168.0.0 slash 24 from 10.2.0.2 awesome and that is an intra area because it is still in the same area because the router or this ABR exists in multiple areas so that is fine but if I go to my ASBR and I do an IP route print I can see I am learning that route as well. But if I do a routing OSPF route print, we can see that it is going to be an inter area route. It's not an intra area route because it knows that it's in a different area. Perfecto. So let's just continue by adding these networks quickly. So I'll add dot one, dot two, dot three, and you could potentially make this a bit faster using a script but i'm not going to work on the script now i'm just quickly going to add these net networks uh, manually so that we can see them get into the routing table and then we can start manipulating some stuff all right so these are all of my LAN subnets now let's quickly have a look on my abr i should be receiving multiple routes and multiple lsas with all of those details and here you can see how crazy it is 
how many LSAs an ABR actually learns. An ABR is one of your busiest routers in the OSPF network because it's having to join multiple areas and it needs to keep multiple LSDBs updated and it's just doing a big function. So I definitely recommend if you do put a router down in your uh, area, like a area border router, make sure it's a beefy router. Don't put down like a small hex S or something because you, you might run into some issues. All right. So I'm learning all of these routes. If I look at my routing table, here I can see all of the routes are injected with a distance of 110. And I've got all of this LAN subnets. Let's go to my ABR, ASBR and let's see if I look at my routes. I'm also learning all of those routes. Hmm, but this might potentially pose a bit of an issue because the more my network grows and the more OSPF neighbors I start getting, the more of these subnets will start getting injected into the routing table. And perhaps I don't want to see all of the routing entries i just want a summarized version of all of the routes then we can do what we call route summarization so this is something you'll also configure on your abr you'll basically be sending out a specific or a bigger prefix or a subnet to the rest of the ospf network so that they don't get all of these massive updates they just get one single entry for all of those networks in essence so to make this work we're going to use what we call an area range so i'm going to go back onto my abr and then from the abr in ospf i'll go into my area ranges and here i see i've already configured something similar so let me just remove that and let's re-add and what we're going to specify is we need to say which area we want to summarize and now we need to say what the range is going to be so if i look at my networks i can see it's 192.168.0.0/24 up until dot 10. now very important thing about route summarization is it needs to be contiguous so your routes needs to basically be in the same vlsm or in the same subnet you can't just say 192.168.0.0/16 and use that as a summarized route because OSPF is not going to like that. You need to find the, let's say the smallest prefix that all of these subnets can exist in. And I've already done the calculation on my side with this is going to be a slash 20 for me. But if you have more routes, then maybe you can use something like a subnet calculator, just see what subnets all of the routes can exist or belong to. All right, so let's add the summarized area route. So I'm going to say area two, my range is going to be 192.168.00 slash 20. And now you can specify a cost or you can leave it as calculated. Calculated means it will use whatever cost OSPF has already figured out, or I can just set it as 10 or something. I'm going to apply this. And now I have an area range defined. So what the ABR now will do is the ABR will send a summarized route out to the rest of the OSPF network. So if I now do our IP route print on the ASBR, I'm only receiving that slash 20. And from the ASBR, I should be able to get to any of those networks. So I can get to 192.168.0.1 and I can get to 192.168.10.1. It doesn't matter to it it's just going to go to a single hop for all of those route entries so it's got a single entry now which is awesome it really saves me some routing table space and it makes it a lot less confusing especially if, if you start working with a lot of smaller subnets maybe you have a, a, a ton of slash 30 networks for your point to point links then uh, your your routing table might get like fluttered with a bunch of information so this is just a nice way to make the, the routing table look a bit smaller um, i just want to also see on my r1 default router which is area one am i also receiving that route yes i am so i am receiving a summarized route from area one and let's see can i ping 192.168.0.1 yes i can so this is awesome let's just look at the lsas for the abr now so now you will see that the LSAs have gone down a little bit, but it is because we have started summarizing some of our outs, which is awesome. Okay, so that covers the stub network. Let's quickly see if we can get the last one that I want to talk about done, which is the not so stubby area or an NSSA area. Now this area has the job of tricking the OSPF network, so to speak. So it's still technically a stub area you're going to have private networks or internal routes in here 
But let's say you have another external AS or autonomous system connecting to your network, but it can't directly connect to your area zero for whatever reason. But a link can be established to one of your remote sites, one of your stubs. So in that event, you can set up that stub as an NSSA, and then that stub will in essence be able to send out LSA type seven messages to the ABR to let it know what external networks exist because a stub network does not operate with LSAs type four or five. It just works with one, two, and three. So a workaround for it was, uh, and this isn't something Microtech did, this is just how OSPF does it. It said, okay, cool, we'll make an NSSA area and we can send out a new type of LSA that will contain that information, which will be accepted by the remote router. So that is kind of what this is for. So let's just quickly get onto the NSSA router, router three. So I just want to get onto Winbox, get onto R3, and then we will also do the setup the same way we've been doing the whole time now. Let's start off with the setup again on the ABR. So I will go into my areas, create a new area, call it area three, set the area ID to 000 000.3, and the type will now be NSSA. Again, if the types don't match, it will also not form an OSPF connection. I will apply this. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add my networks, which is going to be 10.3.0.0/29. So 10.3.0.0/29. This belongs to my area three. I will apply this. And this dynamically created interface, I'm just going to copy and paste because I like, again, having static interfaces. And now that that's been done, let's set up the OSPF on the NSSA router. And I'll go into my routing, OSPF, instance, update my router ID to something unique, which is 192.0.0.5. And this is something I see now. I actually want to show you guys this in a second. Um, and what we're going to do is add an area. So the area is going to be area three, area ID 0003, type NSSA, apply. Let's add the network as 10300/29 for area three. And let's create the static interface. So now that that's been done, OSPF should be up. We should have a neighborship. We should start seeing LSAs and there we can see a type seven LSA, which is in essence just a default route out in that case. And that is the external route to get to the internet via the ASBR. But that's not what we want. We now want to advertise our own public route. So let's go into this topology. I've got a 100.64.200.0/28 network configured between this NSSA router and an external autonomous system. And maybe let's say it's also going to have a static route out to Google secondary DNS server. So let's quickly just make sure that that's set up. So let's do some routes. There's already the secondary route exists uh, and we've got a default route out that way. So let's advertise these routes out to the OSPF network as external routes. So to do this, I'm going to go into my instance and I'm going to say, I want to redistribute my connected routes and I want to redistribute my static routes. Now, again, here you can say it is external as type one or type two, and I'm going to redistribute it as type one. I'll hit apply. And now something cool is going to happen. It's now in essence going to redistribute my connected and static routes to the OSPF network. So if I go to my ABR and I look at my routes, I'll actually see that I will be learning 8884 via that not so stubby area. And it sees it as an X1 route. And I've also got the 100.64.200.0/28. So now on the ABR, if I do a ping to 8.8.4.4, I'm getting a response. But if I do a trace route, I want you to see, we can see it is actually leaving through the NSSA. It's not using the default route out to the internet that it got from its ASBR, because this is a more uh, focused route. It's, it's a more preferenced route. Now, I just want to quickly do another test and I'm going to go onto my R1 router and 
let's quickly see from R1, if I do an IP route print, I can see that I've got a default gateway out via 10101, which is the ABR. But let's see if I ping 8844, I get a response. Let's do a trace route tool, trace route 8844. So now my OSPF network or my other areas are able to break out to that subnet, to that external subnet using the NSSA area. So that's pretty cool because now my traffic goes to my ABR and then from the ABR it goes to the NSSA router and now it just breaks out to the internet in the different path. So that is pretty cool. So this is what we can use the NSSA or not so stubby areas for. And these are typically the only three areas that you'll work on with router OS version seven. There are some use cases on their website, which I will also link in the reference material that you can take a look at because there are definitely different types of areas. There's, uh, I think I might have accidentally said it as well, there's not so stubby areas and then there's totally stubby areas. Um, that's definitely a thing with other routing vendors where you have that option to set that up. Um, but yeah, this is going to be the end of the video. I've shown you how the different LSAs work, um, how to configure different areas on router OS, how to set your network types, how to do route summarization. So I feel like there is a lot of content in the video. It might take you a few rewatches just to fully um, comprehend everything properly, but everything's definitely there to help you with your OSPF journey. Again, this is also not the last video. There will be some future videos on OSPF where we'll do some more stuff like with the virtual links and just dive a bit more into different aspects of OSPF. But these, the first video and the second one, these videos should be the core of OSPF to help you, um, you know, set it up and just have everything running and working and hopefully understanding it a bit better. Anyways, I'd like to thank you guys for watching. I'd like to thank the supporters on YouTube members or Patreon. You guys help support the channel so much. And I'm looking forward to adding more videos to this MTCRE playlist. It's been a, it's been awesome. I've been enjoying it so much. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. See ya.